The shot that makes all the difference. Indian celebrities like filmmaker Kamal Hassan getting inoculated for all to see, to encourage a country of over a billion people to follow his example. If only there were enough jabs available for everyone. Instead, the country that's making vaccines for the rest of the world is faced with a massive shortage. How could this happen? India's vaccination rollout to all adults is hampered by a creaking infrastructure and a new aggressive variant that spreads faster than anywhere else. If India fails, what does this mean for the global pandemic fight? Welcome to our COVID-19 special. Good to have you with us, especially if you're joining us from India. I hope that you and your families are well and safe because the figures we get from India are absolutely shocking. Almost 390,000 new cases of infection and more than 3,500 deaths within the last 24 hours. Now, international help is getting underway with the first emergency aid supplies arriving from the US. But in the end, it's all about getting millions of shots in arms, S ASAP. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, seen here getting his vaccination, generally likes to promote India as the world's pharmacy. But now the chief of the world's biggest vaccine producer in Pune has slammed the Indian government because they didn't order enough jabs in the last few months. Suddenly the government is left standing, empty-handed. We don't have enough vaccines right now. We let you know as soon as we receive the vaccines. Compared to other countries, India trails the US, with just over 42% of the population having received at least one vaccination. In India, 157 million people have been vaccinated at least once. That's a lot of people, but just 9% of the population. The most popular vaccine in India is AstraZeneca, under the name Covishield. After three weeks, Covishield offers 76% efficacy. After the second jab at 12 weeks, this rises to nearly 83%. Covishield is manufactured in India with a license from the European pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca. Until recently, half of the production went from here to destinations all over the world. But because of the steep rise in the number of cases at home, the Indian government has stopped exporting. This also applies to the second vaccine produced in India, Covaxin. It currently can also only be used in India. Covaxin has to be administered in two doses. Six weeks after the first vaccination, it offers protection of 78%. A third Indian vaccine is awaiting approval. Psycovid should come onto the market from mid-May. But will this be enough to vaccinate against the pandemic in India? That's the big question. Rajib Dasgupta is chairperson at the Centre of Social Medicine and Community Health at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. He joins us now, so good to have you. Um, vaccination obviously is seen as the only way out of the pandemic. Is it also the only way out of the crisis in India? No, the current crisis is really of providing clinical care, of providing intensive care to very large numbers, of being able to maintain infrastructure and supply chains. That really is the current crisis. Also, a very large uh, requirement of human resources. Uh, that really is, is, is what's the burning problem now. Vaccination, of course, is crucial, but vaccination is not going to address this problem in the short run, which is a few weeks that we are talking of now. But surely you're trying to still get as many shots in arms as possible. How does this actually work in terms of distribution? Do hospitals order vaccines themselves? Or, uh, who, is, who is deciding who gets the vaccine? Well, the Indian government's prioritization strategy had been by risk categories, which meant uh, health workers and other first care responders first, which, is, uh, which was scheduled over the first three months, and then age group 60, and then age group 45 and above. That's what the prioritization strategy was. And from May 1st, which is tomorrow, it will be open for all adults above the age of 18 years. But several states are facing a 
a shortage in vaccine supplies. And therefore, realistically, it's not going to begin for the 18 plus group from tomorrow. They will certainly have to wait till the supply situation stabilizes. How, how is it possible that there is this shortage, given that uh, India is actually providing the rest of the world with vaccines? Um, what's understood at this point is that this rapid expansion to 45-year age group, which was earlier 50-year-plus uh, with um, comorbidities, this meant an additional demand of 200 to 250 million doses, which was not so readily available. And add to the fact that now that uh, it's 18 years plus, it's a lot more doses of vaccines that we are talking of. So this Sputnik vaccine from Russia has been approved, uh, got the emergency authorization. The first batches are expected perhaps in a few days in the first week of May uh, as a direct import from Russia before being, uh, being manufactured in India by one of the Indian companies. So even if the Sputnik arrives on this schedule, it's still going to be several weeks before actual demands can be met. And therefore, several states have certainly postponed this 18-plus age group uh, till, till a few weeks down the line. And given the fact that there are already two uh, indigenous, uh, let's call them vaccines, uh, Covaxin, we heard in the report, uh, already approved, and then there's another one, uh, Psycov D, which is due to get emergency approval in May. Will those vaccines be for Indians only in order to hopefully, as soon as possible, turn things around? The current emphasis certainly is to be able to immunize as much as possible, again, going by these by this prioritization uh, principle. Uh, as we understand, it will take still a few weeks for adequate vaccines to be back into the supply system uh, to be able to at least clear the, the pending uh, doses, particularly up to age 45. So all of these are certainly going to add to the kitty, but the next few weeks, things are going to be slow. And I don't want to I don't want to even imagine what this delay means for the situation that you're already in at the moment. Um, nevertheless, this may sound heartless, but what is this crisis in India? What does it mean for worldwide vaccine supply? Will there be a knock on effect, for example, uh, when it comes to the COVAX program? Yes, it's very likely, at least uh, by current projections, the contributions from India are certainly going to be delayed, if not actually less. So I'm sure the COVAX uh, group would be worried about it. Uh, I think I think what, what sort of got misconstrued initially was that India produces 60% of the global vaccines, which is true in the aggregate of childhood vaccines. But in this category, influenza vaccines and so on, uh, this contribution is actually to the tune of 20% uh, that experts say. So that 60% figure is, is not entirely applicable here. Just very briefly, what lessons can the rest of the world learn from what's happening in India right now? I mean, we're talking about a pandemic. We have to overcome it together. Sure, we have to overcome it, come it together. We have to learn from each other. Uh, I think the the issue of variants of the of the mutant forms is very crucial. Uh, England responded to it in a certain way. The UK strain, which, as we know, then spread to nearly 100 countries worldwide, became a dominant strain at at, at several in several countries. Similarly, the Indian strain, the B1617, is also considered to be playing a very crucial role. Right. Uh, and I think we certainly need to learn from each other, particularly how variants are to be managed. Okay, Rajib Dasgupta there from uh, the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Thank you so much and do stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Time to answer more of your questions now. Over to Derek. How can genetic engineering be helpful in fighting upcoming pandemics? Genetic engineering is one of those phrases that get thrown around a lot, but I found a, a surprising number of people don't actually know what it means. So, so let's define it before moving forward. When you genetically engineer something, you use tools from fields that are usually now grouped under the label uh, biotechnology 
to manipulate and modify an organism's genome. Uh, the goal is to make it do things the organism wouldn't do otherwise. For example, produce a highly specific medicinal product or produce it in faster ways or produce it in larger amounts. Genetic engineering methods are now common in areas from, from crop science to, to waste mitigation to sustainable fuel development. Uh, but when it comes to modern medicine, genetically modified microorganisms play a, a really central role nowadays. For instance, um, microbes have been engineered to churn out much of the insulin that people with diabetes need to survive. And, and gene editing methods are also key to designing new medications. They're used not only to manufacture uh, complex biologics like, like monoclonal antibodies, but, but also vaccines. Uh, viral vector vaccines, like those made by AstraZeneca, are like, like poster child examples of products made with genetic engineering. They work because the designers were able to splice genes from SARS-CoV-2 into a harmless adenovirus that, that when injected can help make you immune to COVID-19. So genetic engineering is much more than helpful in the fight against pandemics. It'll continue to be a crucial facet of, of reacting to them and containing them in the future. And before we go, BioNTech Pfizer have asked European regulators to authorize their COVID-19 vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds. And they also plan to seek authorization with other regulatory authorities worldwide. Thanks for watching.